what we're about to do yield favorable results, may give us the capacity to benefit others, may help us overcome ignorance and limitation, may clear away all obstacles on the path, may lead us to the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Om Soha. So we are now entering the third point, right? It's seven points of mind training, or mind training in seven points, and 63 instructions. Those 63 instructions are placed under seven key points. So we're entering now the third. And the third is utilizing adversity. Right? And today's uh, prayer and uh, text transmission is on verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. And they are at the bottom of your page, right? Um, mind training 12 to 15 using adversity. What are these instructions? The first, make adversity the path of awakening, the second drive all blame into one, uh, very easily misunderstood that one, <laughs> especially if we have someone in mind, <laughs> which we often do. The third is be grateful to everyone. The fourth, the ultimate protection is emptiness. And the last one for tonight is know what arises as confusion to be the four marks of Buddha nature. So let us, as we've been doing, recite the prayer together and then we will uh, go over it stanza by stanza. I bow to the Lord of compassion. When food and drink are ample and my bedding dry, it is easier to practice but less urgent, as this world is tainted with the five corruptions. May I swiftly develop the mind of renunciation. When pain is all I have, how easy to let go. Bless me to know this burning house is blazing. These problems and vicissitudes are all of my own making. It is only self-cherishing that prompts unskillful action. Bless me to recognize my false self and its poisons. My friends encourage and support me on the path. My enemies provide me with instruction. All beings are the enduring field of merit. Bless me to cultivate deep gratitude for all. The three spheres are empty. There is no actor, no action, and no object of action. Bless me to recognize that this experience is insubstantial, dependent, and impermanent. The all ground is untainted incidentally covered but naturally splendid. Buddha nature is perfect, empty of the separable, the fleeting stains, not empty of the inseparable, unsurpassable qualities, true purity, true self, true bliss, true permanence. Bless me to recognize that all flaws are unreal, mere confused and impermanent appearances. Again, we open the prayer bowing to the Lord of Compassion. Right? By this point, you should be able to recite with me, the Lord of Compassion is not an external being that we invoke to come to our aid. It is an aspect of our own the nature that deals in skillful means. Right? <laughs> So we invoke that part of us to do what? To be ready to employ these instructions to reduce our own suffering and to help reduce the suffering of others. Right. So the first stanza starts, when food and drink are ample and my bedding dry. 
This does not refer to bed wetting. <laughs> you know, when you've uh, lived uh, in a temple, you appreciate <laughs> dry bedding. With, you're usually on the ground, and if you, this harks back to the time of the Buddha. The monks gathered during the rainy season. And very often, ancient monasteries uh, had no, uh, you know, separate floor. It was the ground, right? So if it rains a lot, mm -hmm. the ground is also wet. Basically, what he's saying, you know, when conditions are pleasant, when everything is going well, right, it's easier to practice. You know, if I have the right cushion, I have... You know, the mega uh, zabuton with the, you know, with the, the super fluffy safu, and I have, you know, the, the $25,000 Buddha image, and, you know, climate control, and, you know, I have a, a series of, like, acolytes that ring gongs for me. Uh, it may be easier to practice, but guess what? It, then it's not very urgent. Right? We don't feel motivation to practice when everything is going so well. We have a saying in Spanish, right? Se acuerdan de Santa Barbara cuando truena. People remember Saint Barbara when it's when there's thunder, right? Uh, otherwise, they you know people. As long as circumstances and conditions are pleasant, people have no real motivation to pursue spiritual life. They think, oh, this is good enough. I'm not having a hard time. As this world is tainted, and, and now in this stanza is telling us, you know, there is no such thing as food and drink being ample and the bedding dry. Not in this world. Right? As this world is tainted with the five corruptions, which are what? The corruption of the age, the corruption of life, the corruption of beings, the corruption of afflictions, and the corruption of views. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. Right? As this world is tainted by these five corruptions, may I swiftly develop the mind of renunciation. The mind of renunciation, a lot of people are afraid of it. You know, Oh, I don't want to renounce. What Buddhism is asking you to renounce is suffering. Not happiness. Right? So what's the big deal? That's why the next line is, when pain is all I have, how easy to let go. But first you have to realize that it's all suffering. That's the first noble truth. No matter how many arrangements you try to make in this material world, I'm sorry to break it to you, but it's not going to end well. It has never ended well for anybody, has it? <laughs> At the very least, everybody has died. And everybody will, at the very least, so no matter how you know, many successes you may have, you may have, a, oh, I, I love it when people say, he was perfectly healthy right before he died. Well, <laughs> I had an Indian friend, he was, he was so funny in Massachusetts, he said, my father died. And I said, what of? He said, little heart trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sufficient to kill him. <laughs> but otherwise he was perfectly healthy. <laughs> but we all do the same thing, don't we? We do the same thing. If I can only have, you know, the right job or the right boss or the right car, the right home, you know. If my children call me for my birthday, uh, and then we think, you know, everything's going to be all right. Good luck with that. It's not going to be all right, right? Bless me to know this burning house is blazing, right? The Buddha said, the well, house is burning, and we're inside. 
playing games and distracting ourselves with each other instead of getting out, which is the only rational thing to do. Right. So what are the five corruptions? Right. The corruption of the age refers to something that I guess uh, should not take too much convincing. It refers to environmental disasters, wars, um, earthquakes, climate change, tsunamis. Um, is anybody thinking that these are not happening? Right? Um, what's the latest on Korea? <laughs> you can always count on North Korea for some entertainment of that kind. Um, the corruption of life actually refers to a shortening of lifespan. And this one is difficult for brainwashed Westerners to, con to conceive because we've been told, right, that we live longer now. It's an artifact of reduced child mortality. If you eliminate all the child mortality, right, or most of it, it looks like we're living longer. But honestly, how many 108-year-olds do you know? Because that is the normal lifespan of a human being. You know that we can calculate for every species what is its life expectancy. You know, like this species of dog should live 14 years. This penguin should live blah, blah. This turtle should live blah. Physiologically speaking, right, human beings should live 108 years, give or take a few. How many people do you know of that age? We are amazed when somebody makes it to 100. Amazed. And actually, do you know which is, one would think that the most deaths in this country happen after 65, which is true. But you know what is the second highest mortality in this country? The 20 to, I think it's 20 to 35, something like that. Because of accidents, um, murders, all that stuff. So uh, we're not living longer. Our lifespan is reducing, right? And of course, I mean, if you want to call life, you know, extending your suffering with you know 16 pills an hour, um, you you can. You know, I'm not trying to be harsh here, but the fact is that what some people are living is not life. I'm not going to you know, reveal any details, but some of us received an email about a young woman who's been like, you can take it two ways. You know, I actually saw it like they're torturing her in the hospital. Mm -hmm. right? They've been torturing her for years, mm -hmm. but she's still alive. But then they tell you all that they're doing, it's torture, absolute torture. Is that something you want for yourself or for your loved ones? Not really. So that's corruption of life. Ashi, yes. I like the way you reminded us once of that all the beings, and all the animals that are being killed every day for the benefit of food. Yes. That's definitely a short lifespan. Very short lifespan. Yes. If you're a turkey, you can make it to one year old, you're pretty old, I think, or two years old. And cows, I mean, cows live a long life if you let them, but very few do. Even milk cows, you know they, you know they slaughter them, right? As soon as their milk production is reduced, off with their necks. Right. Um, so, corruption of the age, corruption of life, corruption of beings. 
And this refers to literally the physiology of sentient beings. I don't think anyone would dispute the fact that even if you believe that we're living longer, we're weaker beings. It's no joke that our grandparents walked to school, you know, five miles each way uphill. It's no joke, they did. They did things that would kill us in a week. If we had to go down to the river and beat the dirt out of our clothes, right? we'd all walk around dirty. <laughs> we can't do any of the hard work any of the hard work, right? We need a remote to change the TV because it was too difficult to press the button. Think about it. It was so difficult. Right? It took so much energy right? and strength to push the button or to, you know, change that dial that we had to invent the remote. Now we can do everything by remote. <laughs> everything. You know, you, you clap your hands. You don't need to, you know, oh, push that switch off. <laughs> we can't do anything. Everything is power this, power that. Actually, most of us probably would be unable to drive a car without power steering, <laughs> which everybody did. Right? We are weaklings. And actually, it's not only human beings. Animals also are disappearing, right? Entire species are disappearing. They cannot live in this, in what we've done to this environment. And neither can we. We're all poisoned. We have frogs with three heads coming up and, you know, and fish that don't know how to act, right? Because, you know, the, the, all the fish are on antidepressants now. You, you've read that, right? Mm -hmm. It goes into the water, and, you know, we have, like, fish going around on Prozac. They don't care. They're supposed to go here, but no. Why? <laughs> They've lost everything. They, don't, they lost their instincts. They're, 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 they're high all the time. Look at our plants, you know, our plants are now courtesy of Monsanto. You know, they don't give seeds. Or our plants now are barren on purpose. Because if they had seeds, you didn't have to buy for, you know, planting the next crop from Monsanto. So they have actually made them sterile. You have to buy the seed again from them next year, because what they sold you will not grow again next year. Right? And, and those species, which are not stronger, they're actually weaker. They need all sorts of things, right? They need wood killers and this and that, right? They are invasive. And even if you, a farmer, refuse to plant that, the thing will invade your farm. And then your plants will not survive. Right? So it's plants, it's animals, it's humans. The next one is of afflictions. What is the corruption of afflictions? All sentient beings have always been afflicted, but the level of affliction that we find now is certainly acute. Right? Think about your own experience, right? None of us here is 108. Right? <laughs> Some of us are closer, but nobody here is 108. Did you ever hear of a young man shooting up like 20 children in, in a kindergarten before? Did you ever hear of somebody going into a movie house and shooting up Hundreds of people? No. Uh, recently, here in Texas, a crazy guy went around stabbing people in the neck for the fun of it. He said that he had always dreamt 
of stabbing people in the neck. What kind of dream is that? What are you going to be when you grow up, Johnny? Oh, I'm going to be a mass stabber. The, the depth of afflictions, and it's not only, I'm sorry, but it's not only these cases. Look at our politicians. The things they say in public. The things they dare say that, you know, maybe they thought it years back, but they wouldn't dare say it in public. Now they say the most horrible things, and, and actually they, they have a bigger following if they say it. And the final one is the affliction of views. There is undoubtedly a proliferation of weird, I mean beyond weird, ideologies, uh, religious views, superstitions, we are actually more superstitious now than we've ever been as a human species. The thing is, we don't call it that, right? But we're riddled with superstitions. The greatest of them is that we can be happy here. Materialism is the biggest superstition of all. Have you noticed how they always tell you, right now we haven't solved it, but <laughs> in a few years, right, we will solve this, and whenever they solve a problem, they create three. So those are the five corruptions, and I don't think any reasonable person can deny that we live in the age of the five corruptions. Right? Again, this is not pessimism. Pessimism is to think, this is it, I have to live with it, and there's nothing I can do about it. Buddhism is not pessimist at all. Buddhism tells you, okay, this is what it is, get the hell out. <laughs> there's a safe way out. The door is open. It's in your power to get out. Don't stay in the blazing house. So the next answer. These problems and vicissitudes are all of my own making. It is only self-cherishing that prompts unskillful action. Bless me to recognize my false self and its poisons. This is actually the key to Dharma, because it is accepting responsibility. If you don't accept responsibility, if you actually believe that somebody else is causing all your problems, guess what? You have accepted that you are a powerless victim and somebody else runs your life. And if that's the case, find a tall building and jump. If you're going to declare yourself a victim, which, by the way, is what most of us do, right? He made me do it. She made me do it. I can't deal with it. Oh, they're harping on me. They're... As long as we don't take responsibility, we're never going to solve our problems. And we're not saying, you know, blame yourself, right? The line, the instruction is, Drive all blame into one. It's not yourself, it's your false self. It is the one that says, I am number one, and I will act for my benefit, whether it's helpful to others or not. That is the one that is to blame. Our false self with its three poisons of attachment, aversion, and indifference. That is the root of all our problems. We would never commit an unskillful act if it weren't for that little false being inside us that says, ooh, right? 
I'll gain an advantage if I do this. I'll get ahead if I step on the head of somebody else. Or, I want this, and without this I can't be happy. Or, I'm afraid of that, keep it away from me. Fear, where does it come from? From this false self. You know, remember in Buddhism we say, no hope, no fear. People love the no fear part, but not the no hope part. <laughs> but wherever there is hope, there is fear. If you're hoping, it means you don't have it. And it may or may not come, right? So immediately there is fear. The moment there is hope, there is fear. So no hope, no fear. It is as it is. There's nothing to fear. It's already like this. <laughs> it never was any other way than as it is. So bless me to recognize my false self and its poisons. Now some people have, a, have an issue with saying these problems and vicissitudes are all of my own making. Because you can point and say like, well no, you know, he came over and he hit me on the head. Everything is dependent, right? Things are dependent ones. Where did that relationship start? Did it just happen now? Or is there a background to that? No. Effect happens without a cause. If somebody is doing things to you now, it is your karma. You may have done similar things to either that same individual or another individual in this or in another life. If we don't understand the law of karma, we will always be victims. That's what it means. Accept responsibility. These are of my own making. And because they are of my own making, I am also capable of unmaking them. Isn't that wonderful? If you declare yourself a victim, you have no chance. If you declare yourself responsible, you have every chance. Very little chance of finding what I'm looking for. <laughs> ah, but I did. Mm -hmm. Ashi, I, I heard a man today um, in a gun control thing on the radio. He said, well, he carries a loaded gun everywhere he goes because I refuse to be a victim. Mm -hmm. oh my and I thought, oh my goodness, you're already a victim of fear and, and paranoia. <laughs> but, yes. but that's, you know, it's so scary um, because that person believes utterly that he's taking responsibility for himself in a correct way. And he's, I mean, manifesting to the, you know, four winds that he lives in full fear, right? I mean, you don't prepare to fight back unless you feel that they are they're attacking you, they're after you, yeah, they're right? You. There's no other possibility. All right, so the, uh, on the karma things, um, it starts getting problematic for me when something is happening to you, just because you take responsibility for yourself, if somebody's about to harm you, doesn't mean that you should let them harm you. No. Just because you're thinking, oh, well, maybe I should have done this. Yes, but you should defend yourself without harming them, if at all possible. And frankly, most of the time it is possible. Um, I wanted to uh, yes. if you don't understand French Tashi, right? There, there is yeah, a, yeah, a young artist in France that is uh, 
writing his own music and he's talking a lot about certain things that you say. Mm -hmm. I wish you could. His name is uh, Hong Kong Mala, that means big sick body. Yes. And the story of this young boy is that uh, he jumped in a pool empty. And he harmed himself so much that basically uh, he has big diagnosis and he would never, ever walk again by the doctor. But guess what? He's walking again. And this is because he, for a reason, didn't believe his doctor. I don't know, but he walked again and uh, this courage. And then he started to, to write music and, and especially the lyric are very, very... Um, interesting. I would encourage them to, to look at it. <laughs> I think that's another example. When you take responsibility, at least you have a chance. But if you all look at what happened to me, or poor me, there's no chance. None whatsoever. But taking responsibility does not mean letting things happen to you. Remember, we've said many times that Dharma does not expect you to become a doormat. What it does it, you should understand that all your relationships with all sentient beings are not fresh out of the box. <laughs> we have long-standing, very convoluted relationships with lots of sentient beings, actually, with each and every one of them. So we can't claim like, oh, I was an innocent bystander and this evil person that I've never met before. No. Actually, that evil person that you've never met before was your mother in another life. And you were that person's mother. And that's just for starters. You've had many other relationships with that person in many species of life. That's why in uh, in the Dharma we don't really recommend these forms of Western psychology that try to pinpoint the origin of a problem. <laughs> How far back do you want to go? <laughs> Freud, you crazy man. <laughs> How far back do you want to go? What lifetime would you like to, you know, pay attention to right now? So then we move to this stanza. My friends encourage and support me on the path. By the way, I have to make a clarification here. In Buddhism, we use the terms friends and enemies, perhaps in a different way. Enemies are those who obstruct your spiritual cultivation. And friends are those that support your spiritual cultivation. It has nothing to do with, you know, your drinking bodies may be enemies, according to Buddhism. <laughs> and probably are. Right? While somebody who like constantly is, you know, you think harassing you may be your friend. So this stanza reads, my friends encourage and support me on the path. My enemies provide me with instruction. All beings are the enduring field of merit. Bless me to cultivate deep gratitude for all. So, there's only three feelings. Remember that we've mentioned three feelings whenever we encounter a being, an object, or a situation. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Right? So, it's the same with beings. They're going to be in one of these three categories. All beings. They're either friends. They support your spiritual cultivation. Right? And in that case, we should be grateful to them, right? Because they're helping us on the path. Enemies, right? and they also support your spiritual cultivation because they give you instruction. At the very least, they give you instruction of what not to do. 
but they also provide the opportunity to practice. How are you going to practice patience if everybody's nice? <laughs> How are you going to practice equanimity if you only surround yourself with pleasant people? There's no need for equanimity among pleasant people. The only need for equanimity is when there's some people who are unpleasant. Define equanimity again. Equanimity means that you wish and act the same whether you like or dislike the person. Different from equality. Equality is a wisdom. Right? Is you don't see the difference. But equanimity means you see the difference, but you still say, no, I will be loving, I will be compassionate, and I will rejoice in the welfare of people I like and I don't like. That's equanimity. Yes? One of the most poignant examples of that is when uh, the position of the Dalai Lama, or one of his younger position, was released after 22 years in the of the Chinese, and uh, he asked him, what, you know, what, how did you get through it? You know, he says that he never lost his compassion. The man that tortured him every day, he knew he was a man. He knew he went home to his family, and he, you know, blessed them and kept them in his heart, and was able to take that torture. Oh, wow. It's the truth. Yeah, that is, that is equanimity. <laughs> Right. Of course, we're not called to do all that right now. Right. Our our call is not that. Uh, he was very advanced. So. Yes. <laughs> By all means, avoid torture if possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do we mean that all beings are the enduring field of merit? This is a, a Buddhist concept, right? That there are beings, right? And in our interaction with them, we can accumulate either demerit or merit, right? If you mistreat someone, you accumulate demerit. If you treat them well, if you help them to reduce their suffering, you accumulate merit. So all beings, all beings, are the enduring field of merit. All beings, and this is not only humans. How you treat other beings can help you accumulate enormous merit. They are there to help you, all of them. Without them, what would we do? We'd be like bubble boys and and not have any contact, not, not any opportunity to practice. So bless me to cultivate deep gratitude for all. Why is this? Because when we recognize that everybody is helping us, it becomes a little bit easier to have compassion. Compassion is very natural once you feel gratitude, isn't it? How can you be, you know, how can you feel gratitude for someone and not wish them well? So we have to begin to find in every being, how does this being benefit me? My teacher used to say, even a man who has fallen in a hole can help you avoid the hole, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is no secret I've shared with many of you before. The reason I never took up alcohol drinking was because I grew up with an alcoholic father. And I thank him. <laughs> I saw what I did not want to become from a very early age. And I, frankly, if people could have given me a lot of, you know, advice. And perhaps I would not have followed it. But once I saw, 
I really did not want that. That was instruction. It was very effective instruction. Very effective. How many things have you learned from people who were not acting right? Actually, you know, uh, although in, in modern drama it's lost, but in classical drama, I mean classical, we have to go way back. Right? <laughs> For example, classical Indian drama, classical Chinese drama. The actors that play the evil roles have to be better actors. You know why? Because it's very easy to make a caricature. And if you make a caricature, the drama is worthless. You have to, if you are portraying an evil character, you have to do so in a way that people will say, I also do that. That is the purpose of that, of, of representing an evil character on stage, is so that you can recognize, oh, I do that. It's to recognize your own problems. Of course, it's magnified. That's why it's drama, so it's easier to see. But you should be able to recognize, I have that flaw. I do that. I mistreat people that way. Maybe not to that extent, but I could become one of those. Right? I have my dark side. <laughs> Same with Sunday writing, you can get away with the hero, but not with the villain. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, they're useless. They're useless. But our instruction says, right, that the ultimate protection is emptiness. What does that mean? If you come to a point in your experience, particularly with other sentient beings, where you cannot muster gratitude, when you cannot, you know, with some people we just have such a strong aversion that even if we said, oh, I'm grateful to you, it would be, you know, false. Grateful to you, and I will be more grateful when I am dancing on your grave. <laughs> or as we say in my in my hometown, I, I will be I will sit in my balcony and watch your funeral procession go by. <laughs> and people actually do that, right? It was an old town, so. Every, Houses had balconies, right? And they would sit on their rockers and watch the funeral procession of their enemies. And you're like... <laughs> <laughs> when we get to that point, and believe me, as long as we're ordinary beings, we may, right? Then the ultimate protection is emptiness. And what does that mean? It means that then we need to analyze. Analyze fiercely and ruthlessly. Who is the actor? Is that a real being or is that a projection? Is that a, you know, is that the true self of this person? Is that person that, that body? Is that person that mind? Is that person those feelings? Those consciousnesses? No. It's just if you analyze, it all falls apart. Just like, you know, what is a car? Honestly, what is a car? A car, it's just a term. That is just a name. Where is the car in a car? Like, if you take away the wheels and the, you know, and the chassis and the seats, and where is the car? And you can remove all these places, all these pieces. All these pieces have their own names. So if you re remove all the named parts, where is the car? There was never a car. Or what is a forest? If you remove each tree, right? Where is the forest? There was never a forest. It's a name. Does this make any sense to you? 
So this person, actually the word we use person, right? Persona. You know what that means, right? Literally mask. This person that we think is terrible, evil, is, is that person the body? What, where is that person? There is no such thing. There is no actor, right? No person taking that action. It's just a series of causes and conditions. That's all there is. And the same way you analyze the action itself. And remember that from a philosophical point of view, to, for something to be real, right? It has to be substantial. Like, for example, we just looked at where is the substance of a car? There is no substance, right? You take all the other named parts away. Where is the car? There is no car. It's a word. It's air. It's a concept. Right? So it has to be substantial. It has to be independent. And it has to be permanent. Good luck finding anything with those three categories in phenomenal existence. It does not exist. So if you look at the actor, if you look at the action, if you look at the object of the action, it does not withstand analysis. Now, generally speaking, you, we don't have to go there. We only go there when we cannot generate gratitude for the beings. Right? That's why it says very clearly the ultimate protection is emptiness. Right? What we want is to not have to go there. Right? What we want is for us to spontaneously feel gratitude for all beings and therefore wish them to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering and to embrace happiness and the causes of happiness. That's what we want spontaneously to arise, right? Remember a few days ago we spoke about mounting, giving and taking on the breath, right? Which is not a sit-down practice with... <laughs> it's not heavy breathing with visualization. Tonglen is not heavy breathing and visualization. Tonglen is to make it your true and everyday nature. That whenever you see suffering, you want to take it away. And where, whenever you see a sentient being, you want to give them happiness. That's the true meaning of Tonglen. So here, right, what we really want is that. When that is not possible, then we go into the analytical mode and say, what is it really that bothers me about this person? Is it the hair? Is it the eyes? Is it the teeth? Is it the ankles? And, and you can literally, you can literally go one by one, every part, and you will, will not find the part that offends you. It's the same with attraction, too. Oh. Yeah, with attraction we can go a little bit down. <laughs> yeah. So is it that that's that's invoking something or evoking something inside of you? That's what when you run up against that uh, person or thing, is it that 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 emotion that's coming, that afflicted emotion that's coming, that's a mirror showing your afflicted emotion. It's really yes. nothing to do with that person. No, but in those cases, we apply this analysis to show us it has nothing to do with them. Some of you have heard me say this before, but this is the perfect example. An individual walks in through that door. Right? It is known to some of us and not known to others, right? that individual. Of those who know that individual, some like that individual, and some strongly dislike that individual. The individual appears at the door. Those of us who don't know the individual remain neutral or indifferent. Those who like the individual are happy. And those who dislike the individual 
Our own happy. Are the feelings of any of us coming from the individual? If they came from the individual, we'd all have the same feeling. If the individual were capable of producing that emotion, we'd all have it. Evidently, it's ours. It has nothing to do with him. He's standing there. Yes. So, in the way the way that you just talked about substantial, in that sense, is Buddha nature substantial? Because you can't really. Not phenomenally substantial, no. That's why when we define, and we'll we'll get to it, it's true purity, true self, true bliss, true permanence are the marks of Buddha essence. But there is no physical substance. But we don't assign it to that. We don't impute it. What we impute substance to are material phenomena. Constantly. Oh, it's there. It's not there. We just made it up. So, the three spheres are empty. There is no actor, no action, and no object of action. Bless me to recognize that this experience is insubstantial, dependent, and impermanent. So when you cannot evoke that gratitude for all sentient beings, right? For friends, enemies, and all others, right? When you cannot do that then, Use the ultimate protection, but you don't use the ultimate protection when you don't have to. Why? Right? If you, if it, it's preferable to be able to deal with it without the ultimate protection, right? So that's why it says some people understand it differently, right? And you will see the other commentaries. The ultimate protection is emptiness, so use it all the time. It's like using a you know a hammer as a fly swatter. Not that I would use either of them. <laughs> but it's it's overkill. You don't need it. Right? In fact, it's evidence of lack of spiritual cultivation if you have to be doing this analysis all the time in order to be a good human being. You should be able to be a kind, generous, loving, compassionate human being without having to break everything apart. Shouldn't you? Some of us are beginners. Yes, <laughs> but even for beginners, you know, there's plenty of people that you can feel gratitude for. You don't have to apply it to everybody. It's like scientists are so aware that that's not a table, it's just molecules vibrating, but yet they use it as a table. Exactly. They know the truth behind it. And exactly. If we know the truth behind it, we don't have to... Right. Think about it on the top. Rita, she's a yeah. cottage. She's a cottage. She does think is a natural state of being that, you know, with all those vicissitudes or, no, I would say perversion, mm -hmm. maybe it's distract us to we have, uh, you know, we are subject to the five corruptions too. Yes, and we have very strong afflicted emotions. But as you cultivate the path, that's one of the reasons that we meditate. We don't meditate for meditation, right? We meditate to lower the level of agitation and the level of confusion. That's why we meditate. Meditation is not an end in itself. So as we practice, whether it's with meditation, or with meditation and prayer, meditation and study, meditation and contemplation, right? sooner or later we have to come to the platform of conduct, behavior. Right? And that's where it has many levels. Let me give you, this is something I read today. Uh, there's a Theravadin a Buddhist monk called Ajahn Shah. And they were actually uh, telling an exchange he had with somebody who came over to him and said, you know, I tried to control my 
uh, afflicted emotions, but there are some times when, you know, I see somebody and I want to hit them and I want to kill them. And uh, the monk said, have you hit him? Have you killed him? And he's, he said, no, I haven't. He said, well, you are practicing compassion. <laughs> At this level, hey, it's a great, you know, if you feel very strongly like killing someone and you don't, that's a little bit of compassion right there. Or fear of going to jail. Well, whatever, you know, we'll take good conduct however it comes. So there's different levels, but we should aim at always generating the four immeasurables, they're immeasurable because of the amount of merit they cultivate for us, right? Which is compassion, loving kindness, rejoicing in the welfare of others, and equanimity. Right? So that, that, those should become like our default state. <laughs> Is rejoicing in the welfare of others the same as rejoicing in the merit of others? Or is there a... Well, rejoicing in the welfare of others implies rejoicing in the merit of others. But we don't always see the merit. The welfare we may see and not find the merit, and that's where we judge they don't deserve it. So we should rejoice in both. But the, at the most basic level, it's, we should rejoice whenever anyone is experiencing something that is positive, which we, should, we should rejoice and wish that it never end for them. Which is actually, it's one of the most difficult things to do when we see someone who is undeserving of what they have. And we immediately judge, like, oh, why him, why her? No, if they have it, they earned it. And if you don't accept that, you're denying the law of karma, and you're denying that you can achieve enlightenment. It's as simple as that. So whether someone appears to deserve what they have or not, if they have it, they earned it. Whether now or before, who knows? Remember what people are doing now is not necessarily what they are experiencing, right? They are preparing another experience that will come later. All right, so the next stanza, very important stanza, the all ground is untainted, incidentally covered but naturally splendid. Buddha nature is perfect, empty of the separable, the fleeting stains, not empty of the inseparable, unsurpassable qualities, true purity, true self, true bliss, true permanence. You may notice a pattern here whenever we speak of emptiness. We need to remember that emptiness is not absolute truth. Emptiness is an antidote. Emptiness is a remedy. But as we prayed some days ago, right? Emptiness cures all wrong views. But those who cling to the view of emptiness are incurable. The remedy cannot be overused. If you drink some poison, very often, with some exceptions, but very often they will ask you to take an emetic, right? Something that causes vomiting. It works. Great. Are you going to keep taking it the rest of your life? You will die. It will kill you. If you keep taking the remedy, it will kill you. 
So whenever we encounter, in our prayers, we encounter a mention of emptiness as a remedy, as a protection, right? It's an expedient. Then immediately, we assert ultimate reality, right? What the Buddha taught in the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, Buddha nature or Buddha essence. So the all ground, what is the all ground? The all ground is nothing but pure, non-dual awareness or wisdom. It's untainted. There are no flaws. It's incidentally covered, but naturally splendid. What do we mean by incidentally? That it's not part of its nature. The, the things that cover our Buddha nature are not part of that nature. Buddha nature is perfect. And here is the understanding of, the true understanding of emptiness. Empty of the separable, that which can be separated, that which can be analyzed. Right? Remember, analysis means to break up. Right? It's empty of anything that is compounded, everything that can be broken up, anything that has parts. Those are the fleeting stains. Right? They're stains, but they're fleeting. They're not permanent. Not empty of the inseparable. And what is the inseparable? The unsurpassable qualities. And these are the four unsurpassable qualities. Of course, there are many more, but they come from these four. True purity, true self, true bliss, true permanence. Those are the four marks of Buddha nature. Very often you will see representations, particularly statues and paintings of the Buddha with a swastika on the chest. The swastika is the emblematic form of the four marks of Buddha nature. Swasti. That's very ironic. It's ironic that well, it's, it's been taken to be a symbol. Well, and they, the opposite. but they turned it on its on a side, right? Um, a lot of people look at what the cross has been used for, right? All good symbols have been used perversely by someone. And the pyramid was I. Yes, it's, it's on our paper money. Right? So, uh, this swastika, right? Swasti means su asti, well established, well put. Right? It is permanent. This is what is permanent. This is this four inseparable, unsurpassable qualities. That is the manifestation, the most sublime manifestation of Buddha nature. And that is actually our reality of each and every one of us. So the prayer then ends, bless me to recognize that all flaws are unreal, mere confused and impermanent appearances. we have to come to understand that beyond the analysis of emptiness, there is the understanding of Buddha nature. Without the understanding of Buddha nature, it's very difficult to make progress for two reasons. The first one is personal. We'll think, you know, I'm, I'm never going to get better. I'm doomed, right? How can something that is this twisted ever <laughs> become something so different? Right? And the second is that the Buddhas are distinguished by great love for all beings. As long as we think that there's something wrong with all beings, we may wish to correct them, but we will not love them. Right? So it hurts us both 
in our own development and it hurts us in our relationship with others when we consider that these flaws are real. They're not real, they're incidental stains. If your child, if you have a child and your child comes home all dirty and covered in mud, just because you don't like the mud, you don't throw the child away. Oh, this is a dirty child. I don't want this child anymore. Look at that dirty child. No, you put the child in the bathtub and, you know, it's a pretty child again. We do it with our clothes. When, when your clothes get dirty, you throw them away. Well, some people do, but I don't think the members of this particular group, right? Then you wash it. You don't say, oh, it's dirty, I don't want it anymore. So we have to develop that view of ourselves and of others. And that is actually reality. That is the truth. That is the reality. Evil does not exist. It does not exist. Ultimately, ignorance does not have its substantial existence either. It's a lack. Right? It's a lack of manifestation of wisdom, but it doesn't have... What does it consist of? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. All that is, is pure. Om Swabhava Shuddha. Sarva Dharma Swabhava Shudoham. Om, all is pure as it is. I am pure as I am. Not as I appear. <laughs> as I am. Truly. And that's what we have to cultivate. The remembrance of the Buddha. That's why mantra recitation is so important. The mind will go everywhere. You know that. I don't have to tell you. The mind will go everywhere. If we don't have a practice that allows us to remember our own Buddha nature, we will stray into the quagmire of attachment, aversion, and indifference constantly. How then do, can we say that, you know, bless me to recognize that all flaws are unreal. They're mere confused and impermanent appearances, right? What is behind all that? The old ground is untainted. Buddha nature is perfect. So we have to remember Buddha nature. The term in Sanskrit is anusmriti, constant remembrance. Constant remembrance of what? Of our own Buddha nature. And if we remember our own Buddha nature, we should remember that all sentient beings have Buddha nature too. It's not like suddenly, well, I'm a Buddha and you're not. <laughs> all Buddhas. All Buddhas. In essence. Now, there's degrees of manifestation. But in essence... All the same. All Buddhas are of the same quality as the Buddha, the primordial Buddha, the Adi Buddha. We all have that true nature, that true essence. And that is the essence of mind training, is to allow us to look at that Buddha nature from many, many different angles. But the teaching will always come to the same thing. I'm sorry if you were looking for like a different teaching every, every Thursday. No, it's the same teaching from different angles. You know, the Buddha preached the Four Noble Truths for 45 years. Of course, if, he, if it were today, he would have had come up with, like, the fifth noble truth next year. <laughs> we'll have a seminar, a, a video seminar on the fifth. <laughs> and you know, it would be up to, I don't know how many, the 40 noble truths. Half of them would be secret. 
Secret. Secret. It has to be secret and, and never before given. Uh, it's all said, been said before, and it will be said again. But everything comes back to there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is cessation of suffering, and there is a path to the cessation of suffering, the Four Noble Truths. And every time we meet, you will hear some version of those four. There is no other teaching. The Buddha did not come here for us to philosophize about the nature of the universe. He left that for Carl Sagan. <laughs> he came here to help us to reduce and eventually eliminate our suffering. That is its speculation about, you know that the Buddha refused to answer 14 questions throughout his life. And people asked him over and over and over and over. And he said, it is not that I don't know the answer, it is that the answer is not helpful for you at this moment. Why do you want to know? We are very preoccupied with ontological questions. What is the true meaning of God? Does it reduce your suffering? That is the question. Once you have no suffering, sit down and speculate all you want. You probably won't want to, because the speculation is trying to distract yourself from what's going on. Whenever people asked him one of these questions, the Buddha would always tell the famous story of the man wounded with a poisoned arrow. You've heard that story many times, right? Man is wounded with a poisoned arrow. There's a capable physician right there, willing, able, and ready to extract the poisoned arrow. But the man refuses, because first he needs to know who shot the arrow and what clan he belonged to and what wood was used to make the arrow, and what metal to make the point, and the names of the birds that were used for feathering the arrow, and the man died. <laughs> so the Buddha would often say, if that is the question of the man with the poisoned arrow, once we get the poisoned arrow out, I'll sit with you and we can speculate till the cows come home. But now there is an urgency. Right? We pray here, bless me to know this burning house is blazing. We do not have the urgency yet. In Tibet, actually, you know, this is more the Indian influence, the house is burning. You know what the Tibetans say all the time? You probably have read it. As if your hair were on fire. Um, do you think you'd uh, do something <laughs> about it if your hair were on fire? I think you would. Right. So we need to develop that sense of urge uh, uh, urgency. That is the mind of renunciation. And the mind of renunciation, again, is not to say, oh, you know, I will be Mother Teresa, or I will, you know, dress in a horse hair. And no, that's not renunciation. Renunciation means to come to the understanding that no amount of rearranging, no amount of positioning, no amount of uh, tinkering in this phenomenal existence will bring us permanent happiness. So that just brings up this story that was on AOL today. This guy, Stephen Hawkins, the scientist, and he said, it's good to study how all of this stuff in the universe works so we can control it. Yes. <laughs> what was that? So we can control it? Control it. it. 
control the universe? Yeah. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, is he being sarcastic? No. No. This is, this is the expression of him. <laughs> the very powerful ego. <laughs> very strong. Some people want to control little countries. <laughs> he, he wants to control the universe. He can't even control his own body. True. Which is probably why he has yeah. compensation problems. So let us let us develop this mind of renunciation, right? And and as we develop the, this mind of renunciation, let us then look at all other beings as our benefactors. Whether it's because they directly support us, or because they instruct us, or give us the opportunity to practice, or they even give us the opportunity to do good. Right? They are the field of merit. And once we generate this gratitude for them, then everything else actually starts to fall into place. When we can't, because our afflicted emotions are too strong, then we use the ultimate protection. Analyze. How is this true? Right. Who is this being? What is this action? What is this result? Right. Very often our interpretation of things is way worse than what it is. So what about our desire of companionship? Is this an illusion or what? The, the desires and the human being are, and animals are for companionship? Co companionship yes. is necessary. Is necessary. Is necessary. Uh, it doesn't have to be of any particular kind, right? Um, but we are certainly social animals, and the Dharma says that we can only cultivate in association, right? That's why, you know, we have. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, right? The Sangha is the assembly of practitioners. It is necessary. But nowhere has it been said that we need to become obsessed with a particular individual, which is what we've turned it into in the West. You know, if I can't have him, I will die. And then you have him and he kills you. <laughs> or you want to die. Or you want to die, or you want to kill him. Practice, uh, just practice, deep practice. Right? Very deep practice, right? We don't have to obsess about anyone, right? And we certainly don't have to possess any being, because first of all, we can't. We may think we can, but we cannot possess any sentient being. Like nobody is going to be yours. I hate to break it to you, but nobody is ever going to be yours and yours alone. It's not going to happen, right? What are you going to do? You're going to take them with you? <laughs> Some people in India they tried. You know, they they would burn the the widow, right? With the dead husband. They tried, but you actually think that he was like, oh yeah, she's coming along. <laughs> no. Nobody's coming along. When you go, you go. <laughs> right? And when they go, they go. Like twigs in a river current, right? Two twigs <laughs> come together for a little while. And the current will also separate them sooner or later. Everything that meets separates. Everything that is built falls apart. So we need to then come to this realization. Do I want to place my happiness on this platform of uncertainty and impermanence? No. I will find my true happiness, my true bliss, in Buddha essence, in my own Buddha nature. And it is there already. It is there already. It is already yours. You don't have to move to get it. It's right there. 
little by little we'll let go of those incidental stains, those incidental coverings, and what will be left is natural perfection. So that when you say incidental um, remaining, is it like you miss a person? Like you're with a person and then you've separated, so... Incidental means that it's not part of your nature, right? It's incidental, accidental, it means, you know, people, things, situations come into your life, but they don't define you, right? They pass. Everything passes. Right? That is the nature of this phenomenal existence, right? What lasts? Nothing lasts. If we want something to last, we know that we are sowing the seed of suffering. I don't ever want this to last. You see that a lot in children. Right? You give them a candy and they're torn between wanting to eat it and wanting to keep it. Right? Because they know they'll suffer one way or another. <laughs> if they don't eat it, they, so they keep it, they suffer because they're not eating it. If they eat it all, they suffer because they, they run out of it. Right? The moment you want something to last in this world, you're doomed. So do you just avoid the situation or do you just... No, just experience without attachment. Things come and they go, that's the way. I mean, when you stand in front of a river, do you try to stop the water? It would not be a river anymore, let it flow. That's what makes it what it is. This is what makes our experience what it is. Things, ha things happen and they stop happening, right? And actually think about it. That is the most wonderful thing. Can you imagine the number of things that you would have to get rid of if they didn't go by themselves? Think back in your life. I mean, how many experiences aren't you glad that they're over with? <laughs> it's done. It's great. It's Impermanence is wonderful. Wonderful. Have you ever had a, like a tooth pain, a toothache? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that you don't have it anymore? <laughs> right? If everything were permanent, you'd still have it. Right? It's a great thing. Impermanence is fantastic. And what about mariage? Mariage. Yeah, so it's, it's impermanent too. Well, <laughs> you can. And certainly it's, you know, it's a nice institution. You, by the way, you know that uh, Buddhist monks on. don't perform marriages. You don't? We don't, oh. we don't, you know, curse them, but we don't do <laughs> marriages because it's okay if you want to live with someone, go ahead. And if you want to formalize it, by all means, do a big party and have a religious ceremony, that's great. But understand that, you know, no... no because it's karma. It's, it's, it's not <laughs> permanent. What is permanent? Nothing is permanent. So, yes. what if you have the experience and it's, it's over? Yes. You said it's not permanent. It gets over. But then it leaves you with a very bitter, bitter feeling. And it's like you're, it's like, it's a reminder every day that what happened was not something nice to your soul. How do you get over it? Literally, you have to let it pass. Uh, like we said here, when you realize, right? When pain is all I have, how easy to let go? If it's not good, why are you holding in onto it? You know, we hold on to these painful experiences because they give us identity, but that is a false identity. I am the one who went through this. So do you think we are holding on to Oh, yes, most definitely. By nature, did you see how long does it take to stop my fingers? One sixtieth of that time is what it takes for a thought to disappear unless you hold it. So what if it keeps coming back? You're holding it. <laughs> and you're bringing it back. You're 
recreating it. And you can learn, you know, once, first of all, you know, again, this is the same thing, you know, we were talking about earlier. We think that we're victims of other beings, but we also think we're victims of our mind. You know, the thought comes, where does it come from? No, you're making it every time. Even our, oh, I remember. You're not remembering, you're creating an image. Is it like an attachment, like you just keep... Like yes, it because it. it gives you identity. And I will end here because I know I'm, I'm over, but th this is the secret that people, this is the secret why people suffer so much. It is easier to fortify, to strengthen your false ego through suffering than through pleasure. You know why? Because suffering is more readily available. <laughs> if you could only build your sense of false self on the basis of pleasure, you'd have a pretty shaky sense of false self. But that's why the older people are. What do they talk about? Oh, what I went through, you know, I have 16 operations. And, you know, the, the famous ad that you see, that you used to see on, on the... You know, they went through the nose. <laughs> you know, like all the surgeries and, oh, I take 17 pills. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, I take 94. And that's before 10 o'clock in the morning. It's how... Uh, peoples do it too. Right? Uh, when I'm talking about nations. Oh, never forget what they did to us. And those are the nations that have stronger national identities, right? <laughs> what they did to us. Pain is readily available, so the false self, the ego, latches on to pain, because that's how it perpetuates itself. Ask anybody, who are you? And they don't tell you who they are, they give you a story. Who are you? I'm the one who did this, who did that, who did that, who did that, who has this, who had... I didn't ask you what you did and what you had. Who are you? There's no answer to that. It's all the experiences of the false ego. And which are more available? The painful ones. You can get one any anytime you need one. Right? Why does this happen to me? Because me wants to happen. That's the only answer. So let us dedicate. And please remember, you can use these prayers from now until next Thursday. Right? Recite it, if you can, at least once a day. Right? Contemplate it. Right? And see that it becomes part of your awareness. Right? Not the words that you heard. What does it mean to you? So please let us dedicate. By the merit I grew through all our virtual acts, may all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all embrace happiness and the causes of happiness. May all abide in peace free from self-grasping. May all attain the union of wisdom and compassion. Om ah, um, so ah.